I want you to turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and we'll look especially at verse 20 in just a moment. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And in that passage is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that we proclaim to the world. In that passage is our motivation. The love of Christ constrains us. The fear of the Lord persuades us. And the combination of those motivations sends us out as ambassadors. And it's here, it seems, that we must start. You and I are ambassadors for Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We represent the kingdom of God in a foreign and alien world. There is no such thing as a Christian nation anywhere in the world. There never has been, there is not today. We are citizens of two communities, the community of God and the community in which we live. And we have responsibilities, as we'll see in a moment, to both. Now, to be an ambassador is a position of dignity, although the world may not praise us. It is a position of importance, although the world may neglect or even persecute us. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a man under authority. He is a servant of his government in a foreign land. He is not free to set his own policies or develop his own message. In the same way, we are called to live under the authority of Jesus Christ and the authority of the scriptures. We are servants. When we talk about the Bible and the life of the leader, here is exactly where we must begin. We must live under the authority of the Word of God. We are called not to do our will, but Christ. Now I have looked at the program very carefully that you have before you. You have some explosive issues that are going to come before this conference. There are going to be divisions of opinion and rightly so, and we're going to learn from each other. And it's my prayer that when the last day shall come and you come to the table of our Lord for the communion service, that there will be a great cononia, a oneness of fellowship, and that there will go out from this place a unity of purpose and motivation and message to speak to all of Africa concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But all of these subjects that you are to discuss are to come under the authority of the word of the living God. What does it mean to live under the authority of the word of God? First of all, it means that we live under the authority of God in our personal lives. We are to be holy men of God. We are to live what we preach in our personal lives, a disciplined devotional life, a life of separation from personal evil, such as lying and hating and cheating and prejudice and greed and lust. These things are not to be named among us. The world today is looking for holy men and holy women who live under the authority of the word of God. They're not going to listen to what we say unless we back it up with the way we live in our personal relationships. Secondly, we are under the authority of the word of God for our social relationships as well. We're not isolated persons as Christians. We are part of society with all of its difficulties and problems and hopes. The Bible has much to say about social justice and social action. 
and we're to take its statements about these matters with the same seriousness that we take its statements on personal ethics and matters of doctrine. This is a difficult area. The Christian knows that human society is affected by sin. And we know that any effort we make to improve society will always be incomplete and imperfect. We are not going to build a utopia on earth. Why? Because of human nature. Sin, hate, lust, greed, pride, jealousy keeps us from building paradise on earth. We have the technology today to share the wealth with the world, to build a paradise on earth, but we cannot because of the greed and the lust and the hate in the hearts of men. But as we heard this morning, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and Jesus Christ himself is going to come and set up the utopia that we all dream for and hope for and long for in that day that is yet to come. The political solution or ideology will not solve all of our problems because it is deeper than that. Only Christ can change hearts. But that does not mean that we neglect social and political responsibilities. Christ is concerned about the whole man, including the society he lives in. Many of the great social reforms of the 19th century in Great Britain and America were inspired by evangelical Christians. But the time came when in reaction to a social gospel only, in which the gospel became horizontal only for a while, Many forgot this dimension of the biblical message. They forgot that it was both vertical and horizontal, but this is rapidly changing now. Evangelicals are once again proclaiming a balanced gospel of personal salvation on the one hand and social responsibility on the other. But the main thing is that we bring our social action and responsibility under the authority of the scriptures. Thirdly, we're under authority for our service. It is God who has called us to service. We're not free to choose the place or the manner in which we will serve him. I'm always amazed at the variety of gifts that God has given to the church. Every person in this room has been given a gift from God. You may be a farmer or a laborer or a doctor or a professor, but you have been given a gift of the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, stir up the gift that is within you. What is your gift? Paul said that we are members of the body of Christ so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, become mature as we use our gifts. Now, Jonah tried to flee from God's authority in his ministry, but God prepared a fish to stop him and bring him back. Jeremiah tried to flee from the authority of God's word for his ministry, but he could not. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. I'm sick and tired of talking about God and warning these people to repent and judgment is going to come. But then he said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I could not keep quiet. I had to tell the people the message of God. I know for many of us there are times of discouragement, times when we wish that we didn't have the responsibility of being an ambassador for Christ, but we're under orders. It is God who has called us and we're under the authority of the Word of God. Fourthly, we're under the authority of God's word for our message. Our message is not our own. It is God's. That is why our witnessing and our preaching must be biblical. If it's not founded on the word of God, it becomes our ideas and our opinions. And we would become like the prophets of Jeremiah's day. God said the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision, a false divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their own hearts. 
They are not bringing you my message. Jesus warned against false prophets. He warned against wolves that will come in sheep's clothing. You don't have wolves maybe in Africa. Let's say lions in sheep's clothing. We should be like the Apostle Paul, speaking only to proclaim the word of God. He said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ in him crucified, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. And I say to you, I have had the privilege of preaching this gospel on every continent in most of the countries of the world. And I have found that when I present the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ with authority and simplicity and quoting the very word of God, he takes that message and drives it supernaturally into the human heart. Whether it's at a university, or whatever group it may be in. It is a supernatural message, a supernatural authority, a supernatural power, the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I stand up to preach the gospel today, I no longer worry about whether anybody is going to respond or anybody is going to find Christ. I know that in every audience I talk to, there's some people whose hearts God has prepared if I'm faithful in presenting the message of Christ. I may not see any visible results. We're not to preach for results. We're not to count. We are to be faithful and vindicate the righteousness of God by presenting his word. Now, Satan will do everything he can to divert us from the message of scripture, but we must stand firm. God has spoken and we must be faithful to that message. We're not only under authority. We are men and women tonight in Africa with authority. And this is an awesome thought. We've been given authority by God. That does not mean that we're authoritarian. We're not to dominate, but we've been given authority. When Jesus was upon the earth, he held the crowd spellbound. He talked to the leaders of his day and he spoke as one having authority and he absolutely shook them by the great authority with which he spoke because he was with the authority of God the Father. The great prophets of the past also spoke with authority and their secret is traceable to the fact that they believed their message and they would say time after time, thus saith the Lord or the word of the Lord came unto me saying and they said it over 3,000 times. I don't believe they would tell 3,000 lies. I believe it was the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord did come to Hosea. The word of the Lord did come to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord did come to Isaiah. And they repeated it 3,000 times. I haven't counted it. I read it by an Anglican theologian who did count it. <laughs> Today, if you want to be used of God, if you want men to turn from false messiahs and listen to you, if you want to turn men from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God, you and I must speak, we must work, and we must live with that authority that our Lord himself had. We must breathe in our manner and our message the same strength and power that Jesus had and that he promised the Holy Spirit would give us today. The world longs for authority and certainty. It is weary of theological floundering and uncertainty. Nothing is gained psychologically or spiritually by casting aspersions on the Bible. A generation, especially in the West, that occupied itself with criticism of the scriptures all too soon found itself questioning divine revelation. And I'm convinced that one of the things that emptied the churches of Western Europe is when they began to doubt that this was the word of the living God. People said, well, if the preachers and the theologians doubt it's the word of God, <laughs> what is there? So they left the church. And you go to those great churches and cathedrals today, and they're almost empty. Don't make that mistake in Africa. Take this as God's holy word.
There may be some of you here tonight that are troubled about the Bible. Can you trust it? Is it the infallible word of the living God? If you're having trouble along that line, why don't you accept it by faith as God's word? and see what happens. You see, authority creates faith and faith generates response. And hundreds of people will listen when you speak and talk with authority, but it has to be backed up by your life. The life has to be one of integrity. And if your life is under the authority of God's word and your message is under the authority of God's word, and then you're with the authority of God's word. God is going to use it. The Bible says of itself, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I found that I had in my hands a knife or a sword. I found that the Bible became a flame in my hands. That flame melted away unbelief in the hearts of the people and moved them to decide for Christ. The word became a hammer breaking up stony hearts and shaping them into the likeness of Christ. Is not my word like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? I found that I did not have to rely upon cleverness, nor oratory, nor psychological manipulation of crowds, nor apt illustrations, or striking quotations from famous people. More and more I began to realize it was the scripture itself that God was using, under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a danger here. There's a danger. I am not advocating bibliolatry, that we worship the Bible. This is the revealed message of God. This is God's word, but this is not God. I'm not suggesting that we worship the Bible any more than a soldier worships his gun or a surgeon worships his instruments. I am, however, urging a gospel presentation that says without apology, thus says the Lord. I was thrilled with the goals that your leaders have developed for this assembly. And let us at this conference bring all of these great goals under the clear light of biblical authority and then pray for the courage to forge them into reality in the days ahead. Whatever your position from where you have come, whether it's from Ghana, or the Central Republic, or whether it's from Egypt, or whatever part of Africa you may come from, bring it under the authority of God's word. He's given one or more gifts to every one of you. And God can use you no matter who you are. My beloved brethren and sisters of Africa, you have the greatest challenge, the greatest opportunity, the greatest responsibility of any generation of Africans in the history of this great continent. And as those early disciples brought the gospel to Africa 2,000 years ago, so you in the 20th century are to carry the gospel and the word of God to Africa in this generation. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. I do not know when. It could be a thousand years. We're told not to speculate on dates, but it seems to me that all the prophecies that the Lord left us are coming to a climax at this moment of history. And one of the things that our Lord said was, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Then shall the end come. And I charge you tonight as a servant of Jesus Christ to preach the word, be loyal to the word of the living God. Sir Winston Churchill was invited after he had served as prime minister and he had retired, invited back to Harrow, the great school that he'd gone to and hadn't done too well at, to give a speech. So the headmaster briefed all the students and said to all the students, get ready, bring your notebooks and pencils because you're going to hear a great speech from the greatest Englishman of the 20th century. So they all brought their notebooks expecting to hear a great speech. So Mr. Churchill was introduced and he stood up. 
And he looked over the students and the faculty. He said, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never. 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 And he sat down. <laughs> I say to you tonight, never give up confidence in this book. Never give up the gospel. Never, never, never. God bless Africa and God bless you as you go to all of Africa. Thank you.